think I can fit in this thing. How are we feeling about this? I don't know, ask yourself first. Hey guys, we're in a kind of unfamiliar place. It's in Berkeley on the Ohlone Trail. I'm learning things. I'm here with my friend John Bauders here, a new friend I haven't met before, but he's kind of internet famous. And although he looks like an average citizen, he's actually the mayor of Emeryville. <laughs> um, as as mayors are, they are real people. <laughs> they this are is real something people. that we're learning. You're a big advocate of bikes, making places more walkable and livable and that sort of thing. I'm hoping that you know others can kind of learn from your experiences and be inspired as I have by, by a lot of the work that you've done. So I had a friend that kind of helped me out with a bike from a bike shop nearby. So that's why we're not starting in Emeryville. Some people might be confused by that. I'm a little judgy of that right now, but it's okay. Are we upset? No. We're okay. Not. You have a bike. You have a beautiful bike. You have a recent uh, Mueller Load 60. This guy knows about bikes too. Like I was very surprised. He showed up at the bike shop and he was like, "Oh, that's the recent Mueller Load 60." And I was like, "Oh, that's interesting. You know that." <laughs> but you got your own bike mm -hmm. here, which is very nice. I, I might add. This is my uh, my Flight 280. Yeah, okay. so my like my casual bike around town. Let's uh, get Let's on the get trail. going. All right. All right. Hi. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. This is what we got going on here. Tara is going to be up front holding the camera for your viewing pleasure. So do people often ask you like, where is Emeryville? What, what is Emeryville? Most people tell me Emeryville is the Ikea. So yeah, Pixar that's... and Ikea, that's right. what Emeryville is kind of, some of the things they're known for. Sure. You're getting people reaching out and they're saying, hey, like I, I want to live a, a car free lifestyle. And it seems like you're moving in that direction in a city that makes that pretty conducive. Like what is a city actually optimized for? And I guess that's the thing that you're thinking about that's a lot. Exactly it's like, right. hey, are we optimizing for like the residents of the city? Are we optimizing for economic impact? I mean, I, I guess you have to have a balance of these things. So when you continue to build infrastructure and systems in a manner that are oriented around a vehicle, that's what people outfit their lives for, right? Right. So then they're like, well, I have to have a car to do this. And so- It becomes a necessity. It becomes, yeah, it becomes an extension of what their life is. And I've been often calling it a bit of a renaissance that we're experiencing right now. But I guess overall, it's just, you know, more sharing of ideas, information. I mean, we, we were visiting the Netherlands recently and, and the built environment there is dramatically different than it is here. In the United States, we immediately say, well, electric vehicles. And now we're spending right. billions of dollars on electric vehicle charging stations, which don't get me wrong, like moving away from gasoline and oil consumption is is great but it's like we we are incapable of making actual systems change because we're so comfortable with what we have and we're really sure that freedom is an automobile we like we're taught that since you know before we're 16 and the truth is it's not actually very liberating as soon as you buy one you are like forced to make all the investments associated with it and you make all these economic expenditures and right. choices around it and it's actually it, it imprisons you my bicycle is the most liberating thing i have no i have no obligation to fuel this thing yeah. uh it's fueled on like breakfast burritos right. you know that's right. what it's fueled on so <laughs> there was a, a forbes magazine article that you know highlighted a study done in germany about the lifetime cost to people for owning just a small car seven hundred thousand dollars right over the course of their life and i thought to myself really sneaky way of imprisoning people in Longer hours of work, longer years of life spent working, less opportunity for upward social and economic mobility. I mean, go to college, own a home earlier, like all the things that you give up because you have a car payment, because you pay for insurance, for gas, for maintenance. People look at me all the time and they're like, what are you, 25? And I'm like, I'm almost 45. And I attribute it to being outdoors and being social. Right. I always tell people, my mantra is like, go outside. Like, yeah. why sit in a car all day and spend all your money on a car? Like, The car is branded and marketed in the US specifically. You know, there's been this phrase that's come up, that people have a love affair with the automobile. Oh, they absolutely do. The brand of the bicycle in the US, it kind of needs to be re redone. I think most people, when they think of a bicycle, they in the U.S. specifically, they think of a bike as a form of recreation and sport. They don't think of it as a form of transportation. The bicycle is something you use until you graduate to your automobile at 16. And something that you've been particularly focused on is, is, the, is the built infrastructure. This topic has come up a lot. It's like, if you build it, they will come. And if you waited for people that were out and you said, well, we're not gonna build this for bikes because there's nobody biking. People aren't biking, not because they don't want to. It's because it's not safe. 
you know, I hear the feedback from my constituents, how our infrastructure changes have led to lifestyle changes. We're entering Emeryville here at this crossing on the other side. Oh, nice. It's a bicycle pedestrian path that is on an old rail trail on the northern third of the city. And you'll see the front doors on the left up here of all these residences walk out onto this trail. Oh, wow. The pole up here, we, we, there's cameras that um, sense and detect us, and it will activate um, pedestrian flashers for us as we're approaching. You'll see here we did speed tables to approach the crossing. Right. So the crossing is curb height for everybody. Something we don't see too much in America, but we're, we see it quite a bit in the Netherlands. And so this block, for example, is close to traffic completely. The business side of the community is over here, and this, again, all residential on the left. We wanted to get cars off of the street because there are several family-oriented components of the city along Doyle Street and cars were speeding up the street as a pass through to avoid the traffic lights on the streets that are parallel to it on either side. We put in uh, two block closures, so essentially there's no incentive for a car to use this route because it does not actually take you through the city. It's anymore. not continuous. It's not continuous. For motorists, that's an important deal, but really for anybody that's going anywhere, it needs to be a complete solution. And so you might build up all this stuff, and if you don't have it relatively complete, a lot of people still are not going to use it. They say, well, I can use it for recreation purposes, but I actually want to get somewhere. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good to bought this one. You bought that one? Yeah. Welcome to the Greenway. <laughs> nice. Talked to that guy about a week ago about trying to find a place along a bike route. Oh, wow. He was looking at the house next to mine, and he said, I'm trying to buy this house by you because it's along the bikeway. And I said, well, good luck, and he didn't get it. But I just saw him there. He bought the one over here. You know, I have a guy uh, who I know, his name's Dave, who lives up on um, one of the buildings we passed. He lives right on the Greenway. When we started that Doyle Street experiment, he reached out to me and he's like, what's the chance that you guys are gonna actually keep it? And I was like, 100%. As soon as we put it in, he goes, you know, um, on my days to take the kids, he has two kids, to take the kids to daycare, he's like, I have a cargo bike, I put the kids in the cargo bike and I bike them. And he says, on the days that my wife takes them, she's driving them. And he goes, after I took the kids a couple days, my wife went to take them to daycare. They go, no, we wanna go in the bike. And she's like, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So he said to his wife, well, what if um, you go with us and we'll all go together in the bike? They took the trip together. She saw how much the kids loved it. They saw f their friends on the way to daycare. They, they, they were like paying attention, right? They're not looking yeah. at a electronic device in the backseat of an it's SUV. Not, it's not, yeah, and it's They're, not necessary in a bike. The, no, the stimulation. You're the completely stimulated. She's like, you know what? This isn't so bad. So now, regardless of who's, who's taking the kids, they go via bike. That's awesome. And those children are now growing up with the experience of like, this is how I can get places. My mom and dad are part of that. So we're, we're now on the newest segment of the Greenway. Uh, you'll be able to take it down and there'll be 500 new units of homes connected to the Greenway, just like the pieces we did before. From right here, I don't see any car license plates, so I don't have anything that tells me that we're like not in America. But actually, if you look at like the infrastructure and that sort of thing, I, I kind of feel a bit like I'm in Europe or even the Netherlands for that matter. Like a lot of this just public space to enjoy. It's unfortunate that, that that's what I associate. I don't associate that so much with many of the places in America, but. So this, uh, right now, this, this shopping center is planning to do a revamp and they're gonna eliminate this lane and the cycle track is gonna complete, continue out here, out to the main road. The building over here on the right is gonna become a grocery store. So people will be able to take their cargo bikes across this bridge to those residences, come down here, bike to their grocery store, wow. pick up what they want and go right back. Yeah. They won't need to take a car. I should note that it's not abandoned here. It's just a little early in the morning. Right we're, yeah, we're, the mall doesn't open for another <laughs> another half hour. So we're, we're, that's the only reason why. Cool. So now we're on the uh, San Francisco Bay Trail. Okay. It'll be quieter in a little bit here. Okay, I think this is a, a, a great opportunity to segue in, into this idea that people might feel kind of powerless over their built environment. They might feel a bit powerless in government as well. I I've certainly have experienced that. I'm sure many people have experienced that. I do. You know, ha can, can you actually have an impact? Can I request that I have, a, you know, better lighting or a better walkway or a better bike path? And, and how do I do that? And I really have to applaud you for the approach that you take. And actually, I mean, in a lot of ways, that's how you got into politics, right? Right. Where you just started showing up at, at council meetings and, and speaking up and you say, oh, wow, this, this guy actually knows a little bit about this. And you're presenting a dissenting perspective, which, which we need in the community. You know, it's not always so good just to kind of continue to go with the flow and continue to optimize for comfort or cars or whatever. It can't just be 
one politician doing it absolutely on their own, right? not absolutely and this is why when people are always like run for mayor of my town i'm like do you think it's going to change if i'm just the same voice in a different place like yes there needs to actually be a symphony of people singing the same song and, and, and evangelizing people about all the benefits of having a people-oriented community right one that that it's safer it's healthier it's greener, it's more environmentally friendly, it has better economic results for individual citizens and businesses and the community. Yeah. These are all parts of actually building like integrated people-oriented spaces. People just don't really grasp that yet. I'm a disabled vet, I served in Iraq, I came back and I was just pretty upset with the government because I didn't really agree with a lot of things that were going on there. But I didn't feel like I can actually change anything there. So I said, hey, instead of doing that, I'm gonna try and just like impact some positive change by addition as, as opposed to subtraction. But I think on the local level, it seems to be the, one of the bigger opportunities that I think is oftentimes missed. I would suspect that a lot of times it ends up being just the business owners or like retirees or like yep. parents, but, but maybe it doesn't always necessarily represent a whole cross section. I completely agree with you. Older folks are sometimes overrepresented in elected office, and no nothing against it, but people who are less inclined to wanting to change their behavior, they're right. comfortable with what they do. You know, if they haven't been bicycling or walking as their primary way of doing things for the last 30 or 40 years, they're not inclined to start. You're, you're too young, you sometimes don't have enough experience. You're too old, you, you're too far away from what other people need in, in your life. We need to have more balance in who's representing us because that's how you ultimately have a more balanced discussion because the community can turn out to all kinds of meetings and say, we need bike lanes. And it falls on the ears of people who are like, well, I would never use that. So mm -hmm. ergo, we don't need that. You came into it from a, a bit of an unorthodox approach. You know, you, you just started participating in the city council meetings and then eventually requested to kind of run or something like that and then yeah I, I was showed up to a, a couple of meetings about a housing project and a council member at one of those meetings gave me her card and asked to meet with me and asked if I would be interested in serving on the city's housing committee she's like we need somebody with a different perspective I mean I I lived with housing insecurity myself you know I didn't have the best uh, young adulthood being openly gay uh, my family I think really struggled with some of that and created a lot of problems for me uh, socially, my mental wellness wasn't the best in my early adulthood and bounced around places early in my in my post-educational years and I, I ended up in a boarding house in LA. I just had a different experience of what it was it was like to kind of make it all work. I felt like I had a perspective that was different and I was willing to share it and there was somebody on the city council at the time who really appreciated and valued that voice and invited me to be more engaged and it was kind of the launching pad for me to become more involved in my city. I had no idea that I would ever be the mayor of this town. But you know, my philosophy has always been, um, I try to give as much as I can because I find that giving is a multiplier back to you. You can have a really challenging week. I've had times where it, it feels like, okay, I'm, I'm doing all this work. Does anyone even notice what we're doing right now? Or do people have any appreciation for it? And I've had mornings where I, wake up to a random email in my inbox from a constituent who says, you don't know me, but I just want you to know that I am grateful for you and the work you do on behalf of our city because of this or that. And when you get little things like that, you realize that there's a lot of people who do see what you're doing, yeah. who never actually reach out. It's, it's amazing how much strength you get out of one person recognizing your ability to do something that was challenging. The bike lane is not wide, Okay, you're good after this car. And this is an example of a transit-oriented corridor. It's overbuilt for cars. The left side of the road over there, where you see the bike lane with the buffer, we're gonna put a fully separated two-directional cycle track that's separated and has the capacity for cargo bikes, strollers, child carriers, things like that, on that side. And we're gonna put transit priority lanes, red lanes. So the street right here in front of us is 45th Street. And this is a bicycle boulevard that's an east-west. We have three of them that go across the city this way that are bike priority. And it ends at Horton Street. And this is an existing building from an old paint factory that is being repurposed into an office component with a 500 residential unit project behind it in a park. We negotiated that rather than have the bike boulevard end here with a park behind it, they had to blow a hole through the building. Wow. And the bike path will actually go through the middle of the building. Love it. 
So there's a 26 foot wide bike path and then two pedestrian corridors that will go straight through this building and it will enter into a giant two acre park behind it when it's done. Yeah. Like people don't think you can demand these things or request these things and like, this is part of being in engagement and relationship with your community. Like residents got together, we came up with ideas for things we wanted. We sat down with the development director for the project. We negotiated the addition of this and other features. There's also going to be a free transit shuttle that services this neighborhood and takes people directly to BART during commute hours, mornings oh, that's and evenings. Excellent. As somebody that bikes and, and can oftentimes be in places where I feel pretty uncomfortable and unwelcome as a cyclist, like the idea that you have this and like to feel welcome, like, and we were talking about that before, mm -hmm. of like how do we encourage more people to get out on bikes and like build the space for it. Most of America at the moment is built for cars. And it's very clear that you're not using that mode of transportation you are deprioritized. Mm -hmm. You are you are not the priority. And you got to start somewhere, and 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 it seems like in a lot of ways you're a lot further along than a lot of communities. But it's opportunities for this everywhere, really, in a lot of ways. Here it's like, okay, well, here's a natural nexus, and what's the barrier? You could look at a building and be like, well, there's nothing we can do. There's a building there, and people are going to have to go around here and go around. No, no, no. Like, put it through the building, and people are right. like, what? What? It's put it through the building, and instead you're going to have something that is going to be completely like innovative, you're gonna come all the way down this long straight street and you're gonna be able to see on the back end of it that there's a park through that building and you're gonna be invited into it. It changes the user's experience in their community and, and, and you know, they'll go through it and then they're gonna to get to their side and they're gonna see the bridge and then they're gonna realize I can bike to the stores and the grocery and like, and then you change people's like attitudes. Good morning. Hello. Hi. <laughs> oh, it's so great. A lot of money that we spend goes to like these highway improvement projects. Yes. This mm -hmm. is something that's happened a lot in California. If you take like a fraction of that budget, it's amazing how much actually bike infrastructure, how much infrastructure you can build for the communities and like, like the space that people spend so much time in. It's always like, oh, let's put an additional lane there. Can you just speak to that? Because I, I want you to just dispel this for Mike, somebody that actually has experience. When you add an additional lane, does this actually <laughs> help? It helps add cars. That's all it does. If you add a lane, all you're doing is inducing more traffic. Uh, you say you're adding a lane, people decide, oh, well, they're making more space for me to use my even bigger truck or and or SUV. Hey, I don't go on the highway because there's too much traffic. You add a lane, traffic subsides a little bit. Okay, I go back on the highway now. Yeah. If you're frustrated because you're promised a new highway lane and then you see, oh, there's more cars, whatever, okay. Imagine now if I built a new bike lane everywhere. I'm inducing bike use. Right. Like it's the same thing, right? Yeah. So if the goal is, oh, we want, you know, and I get that a lot of car people like give lip service to climate issues. They're like, oh, I care about the climate. Okay, but you're still in a car. So, and then they'll say, well, I can't, I don't, you're saying that, but you don't live in a rural area or you don't know what it's like to have to move materials or this or that. Like there are still solutions to that. And I'm not saying that there are never times for a car. Right. But the majority of people don't ever choose to not use a car when the options exist and it's actually better for the environment, their health and the convenience and safety of the community to not use a car. You don't need to take your car a half mile every time to go do something on a day like this. You don't need to do that. But people do it because they've become accustomed to it and because we've built infrastructure that gives them that. So and it's a really unfortunate reality though if somebody can't travel a half a mile or even a mile and do it safely on a bike. I gotta say, like, you know, we've been kind of biking around and it just feel just like calm and like, okay, I feel like safe and relatively protected. When we did this project with, you know, the public market uh, redeveloped this entire site, right? We prioritized open space, people, dense housing that gives people proximity to food, services, open, like, you know, activities for their children. I mean, look at all the people who come out here. This park is so well loved. So we kind of got connected on Twitter. Some people asked some questions on Twitter. Sure. Maybe if you're cool with it, we could just ask like take questions. an opportunity yeah. to like ask a couple questions. My, my tweet, I should I should note what it was specifically. <laughs> this was uh, relatively carefully thought out. Stoked to be meeting with the coolest mayor in America, John Waters, tomorrow for a riding interview. He's a bike advocate icon. And we have so many questions. What do you want to know? I deemed you the coolest and this is subjective. <laughs> and. Somebody did say that uh, Mayor Wu takes that honor currently. I think she does. 
I don't know her personally. I'll save that judgment. Hopefully I can interview her in the future. We'll see. I'm uh, coming to Boston in June, Mayor Wu, and we are going to bike the Mass Avenue bike lane together, at which point I will be able to uh, confirm your status as America's coolest mayor. <laughs> so, uh, and then you need to go ride with Chris and Tara. How do you measure progress and how do you make sure to keep moving your city into a less car dependent one? You prioritize people. It's a choice. You have to turn off on the infrastructure and planning side the focus on everything car oriented, which is more travel lanes, synchronized signals, throughput, gentle curves for cars to basically be encouraged to make the rolling stop on a right turn. You have to make engineering choices, planning and funding choices. We talked a little bit about budgets and, and what you do with prioritizing money. And so I think on the, what do you do to make something less car centric? You do the opposite. You make it more people oriented. You do this instead. I think you can measure success different ways. I don't know that there's a single answer to that question. One metric of success is uh, safety. So something I track really carefully in the county is um, pedestrian and bicycle injuries and accidents. Similarly, if you actually get more people out of their vehicle and into choosing a different mode, that's success. Um, to bring in more money to help make it possible to finance new projects without taxing your own residents further, that's another form of success. Yeah. Quick one, will you attend the International Cargo Bike Festival in October <laughs> in Amsterdam? <laughs> well, I know you're talking about going to Amsterdam. I am you talking might be able about to going. a couple of two. But... So actually, Yosu puts on the Cargo Bike Festival. He actually asked the question, what is your opinion of the potential of cargo bikes in Emeryville, both for private and business use? I think kind of the next iteration, you build the infrastructure, yeah. right? And you, you help show people that the network is not just these random blocks of spaces, but it's actually integrated. There's kind of like a dense core here. I've thought about ways that the city could actually incentivize or ordain um, locally obligation that local de deliveries that originate and end in Emeryville have to be done by something other than a vehicle. From New York, Queens Greenway. We all know electric cargo bikes are the future of US family urban transportation but so many politicians have a windshield perspective. What do you think is the best way to get more politicians to be courageous? Get them on a bike. So I recently had a really uh, beautiful experience. I hosted a, a series of state transportation agency leaders here for a mini tour of kind of the microcosm of what you can do, all the different types of projects and innovations you can do in a one square mile space. And I asked the vice chair of our county commission to join me and she's, I think she's open about the fact she's in her 70s. She hasn't ridden a bicycle in over 25 years. And at first she was like, there's no way I'm riding a bike around your town with you for an hour. And I was like, it's actually really easy. You can do it. And she relented and she did it. And the joy she had was amazing. She went back to the commission the following meeting and she told everybody, I didn't want to do it, but I had so much fun. And I had mayors from other cities go, well, when are you going to come to my city and bike with me? If you're a friend of a politician, right. take them on a bike ride with you. Right, absolutely. Talk to them about your experience. Talk to them about what your family does. Like we, we take our kids here, we go here, like let them see how this is a normal part of your life because then they have that familial experience when they go back to a decision situation of there are people close to me who I know who would want that for right. their kids or their family. And it imbues them with a different a different, right. something different than the windshield normalizes it normalizes it, it for humanizes them. Humanizes it. Yeah. yeah. And if they have the experience and exposure to it personally, it often makes it easier for them to relate to it. What is one improvement to bike infrastructure you would want to see adopted by every Bay Area city? Protected intersections. Okay. The number yeah. one source in Alameda County for bicycle accidents and injuries <laughs> is within 100 feet of a crosswalk or an intersection. Uh, about 74% of people who are hit by a car are hit in a crosswalk. When will John implement North America's first beg button for cars? <laughs> I don't know that we no, I talked that. About, I've talked about that. I've <laughs> talked about the fact that there should be on bicycle priority routes like the Greenway that we should actually have a light for the bikes that makes the bike the priority traffic and the cars have to actually approach a stop and wait for them to activate a signal in the street that gives them the priority. Well, actually, you know what? We, we should, should switch. We should take this opportunity. We you know, we we're talking about you got to ride a cargo bike. I just got to push this forward, kickstand goes up. I think I can fit in this thing. How are we feeling about this? I don't know, ask yourself first. <laughs> All right. Look at this. I'm, I'm impressed. You seem to know a thing or two about riding a bicycle there. I have not ridden a bike where the front wheel is this far away from me. It's a, it's so. a little weird. It takes a little getting used to, but and I think this is also a good thing for, you know, the average audience, too. We were talking about, like, getting people out on bikes and yeah, having talking. the experience. People are probably pretty intimidated looking at this thing, like, oh, there's no way I could ride that. But you kind of just hopped on it, and then you threw a 200-pound human in here. Yeah, so. you can do this. What's up? You like my ride? Yeah. 
<laughs> Sweet. All right. All right, hold on. I'll put this down first. Uh, no, I, I just. You get out first? Yeah. Okay. All right. On that note, um, I really appreciate it. This is just, it's awesome. Awesome. I appreciate yeah. you coming to Emeryville. Yeah. It was really <laughs> nice of you, actually. Thanks. Yeah, we'll awesome. do this again in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah.